Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jennifer Hicks, and I am the communication director for the Greater Spokane area for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it's wonderful to see all of you here today. I'm excited about this topic, uh, religious freedom, and so pleased with our speaker today, who I will introduce in a little bit. We're going to begin with... Um, an opening song. We're going to start with America the Beautiful. So if you can find a hymn book in front of you, it's on, it's number 338. And then we'll have an opening prayer offered by Kathy York. And um, our organist is Lori Burns and Lorraine Mon will be our chorister today. So thank you for that. Our kind Father in heaven, we are so grateful to gather here this day as family, friends, and community. We're grateful for the presence of Brother Matt Latimer and for um, his willingness to come and share his knowledge and his concern about the um, subject of religious freedom. 
We ask that thy um, spirit will be here, that our hearts and our minds will be opened, that we might be receptive to these words, that we might better understand what it means to have religious freedom, that we might uh, recognize the challenges that it's facing, and that we as a people of faith might um, do our part to help protect it. We're grateful for the gospel in our lives, Father, and we are grateful for, the, for thy son, Jesus Christ, and we say these things in his holy name. Amen. Okay, again, welcome to this event um, about religious freedom featuring our speaker, Matt Latimer. And I'm just so glad that all of you could be here today. I wanted to let you know that right when, when we're finished at one o'clock, we will invite you to come in, to, that we can open the dividers here. We invite you to come into the room just behind the chapel for some small bites. We have um, sandwiches and vegetables and things like that and fruit. So I hope you'll stay for a little bit and visit. <clears throat> And I want to, um, again, thank Lori Burns for being our organist today and Lorraine Mon for leading the music. And thank you, Kathy York, for that beautiful invocation. Um, I also want to thank our wonderful speaker that's here. I'm so excited to introduce Matt Latimer to you. Matt comes from the west side of the state. He's from Snohomish, Washington. And he is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He has served in a variety of church positions, including high counselor, bishop, stake president, and others. And he's currently serving as the assistant director of communication and as religious freedom specialist for the North America West area of the church. And that encompasses California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alaska, Hawaii, and North Idaho. He has practiced law in the Seattle area for 27 years, and he is an affiliate professor of law at the University of Washington Law School, where he teaches on a variety of topics. And Matt and his lovely wife, Pam, have five sons and one beautiful granddaughter. And I've had the opportunity to meet Pam, and she's just a lovely person. So Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you now to teach us more about religious freedom to, to discuss this topic. And, and he did say if there's time, he will have Q&A. If not, he's going to stay after, and you're welcome to ask him questions in the other room. So Matt, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. I flew in from Seattle this morning. It's raining in Seattle, if you can believe that. And I think it's kind of cold here. I was expecting yeah. it to get out of that. So uh, we're great. I'm grateful to be with you. I'm grateful for Jennifer's uh, invite. And um, I'm excited to be able to share this with you. So uh, let me just tell you, let me start with a story. Um, and this, maybe it's a story you've heard, but probably most of you haven't heard this story. It's about a man named Ray Turcaso. So uh, in 19, the 1950s, Ray was a young father. He was married to his wife, Linda. They lived in Maryland. Uh, Ray had, and Linda had two small children. And Ray was a, a bookkeeper at a construction company in Maryland. And his boss had asked him if he would become a notary public. Uh, and by doing so, he could notarize various documents useful to the business. It would be helpful to his career. It would be helpful to the company. And so Ray began the process of becoming a notary public, which at the time, at least, meant that he needed to get an endorsement from one of his local state senator. It, mean, it meant that he had to get approval from the governor of the state. And then once those approvals were obtained, he got a letter in the mail that said, please present yourself at the county, local county courthouse and fill out the appropriate paperwork and you can be sworn in as a notary public. Now, Ray was a, a veteran of two wars, World War II, uh, as well as the Korean conflict or war. Uh, he, you know, they, they, weren't, they didn't have a lot of money, they weren't, uh, people that were you know, incredibly privileged, but this represented a great opportunity for him to be able to advance his career uh, and to do something you know, of service, continued service to his country. So Ray gets, gets his letter, he walks down to the courthouse, or drives down the courthouse, walks into the door, begins filling out the paperwork with the county clerk, um, and one of the, the requirements for the, that's embedded in the paperwork is that he needs to certify that he will uphold the laws 
of the state of Maryland and the laws of the United States, and he will sustain and, and uphold the Constitution of the United States. To that, Roy can readily agree. Uh, the other thing that he must certify to do is that he has a belief in God. Now, Roy is an atheist, and this certification requires that he certifies that he believes in God and that, that on penalty of perjury, he would be signing this affirmation or this oath. Now, this was the law in the state of Maryland at the time. Um, Roy didn't feel like he could in good conscience certify that belief. He just didn't have a belief in God. Uh, and so he walked away from the courthouse a little dejected. And as things wore on throughout the day, he came home and he talked to Linda. And Linda said, what's the matter? And he kind of said, nothing, right? That's what we do, guys, right? <laughs> nothing. Uh, but it really bothered him. And after he explained to Linwood, uh, Linda what happened, uh, you know, near the end of the evening, uh, Linda said, well, what do you want to do about it, Roy? And he says, I think I'm going to sue. And thus began a several years of litigation around whether or not Roy's rights to religious freedom were violated by a mandatory oath that he had to sign in order to serve uh, as a notary public in the state of Maryland. Eventually, it went up to the, all the way to the Supreme Court, the state of Maryland saying, look, this is not a violation of religious freedom. This man is an atheist. Uh, Roy's attorneys, of course, argued that it was, that it didn't matter whether it was he believed in God or not. It was still a fundamental belief about the existence and its purpose, and therefore denying someone the ability to participate uh, in various activities uh, related to civic service simply because they didn't believe the way other people believed would be a violation of its religious freedom. Does anybody know how this case turned out? Anybody that read? I, I wouldn't expect you would. <laughs> well, Roy wins. The Supreme Court affirms that this is a case uh, that violated the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Does that surprise you? Some of you say no, yeah. So the I, I, reason I love to tell this story is because it is kind of a surprising story because when we talk about religious freedom, we usually are talking about someone who has a deep religious conviction about a, a particular divine being. Um, and here is a, here's a Supreme Court case uh, that dealt with someone who had absolutely no faith whatsoever, at least according to Roy. And yet he had a deep conviction. Uh, you know, he was a moral man. He was a patriotic man. He was a good citizen. He was honest. Um, but he just, didn't, he just feel, didn't feel like he could sign his name to a piece of paper that required to say that he believed something he didn't believe. And he didn't think it was right that the government could impose a requirement on someone to violate their conscience like that. And it turns out that he was, he was right. The Supreme Court agreed with him. So part of telling that story for you today is just to suggest to, to you that religious freedom is for everybody, whether they're religious or not. So many of you in this room, I'm sure, are persons of faith, uh, but, but maybe there's a few that aren't, and that's great. Um, but oftentimes, the, the critique of, of persons who try to talk about or promote religious freedom is that they're, they're, they're trying to get some advantage over those who don't believe. And I want to suggest to you, and hopefully will convince you by the end here, that religious freedom is for everybody, uh, and it's especially for those whose beliefs are out of the mainstream. Because those beliefs, those of us who have beliefs that kind of comport with the mainstream of our society or our culture, we don't really need the protections that religious freedom provisions provide. It's the people that don't believe uh, and don't have the political power to protect those beliefs that need those protections. So I brought with me today a gavel. Um, and I give, I give a lot of youth uh, talks on this topic. And, um, and I brought it tonight to Jennifer. So I'm doing it tonight too for some youth. And, um, and I also brought in my suitcase a judge's robe. And I usually ask one of the young people to come up, don the judge's robes, I give them the gavel, we announce their arrival as the judge, and then I, I share with them a series of um, scenarios and ask them to make a ruling. So is any, no, anybody want to come up and do that? No, I won't ask you to do that. <laughs> but it's kind of fun. So I'm going I'm to do that tonight. Um, but I, just, I brought it here just in case you get out of order. Uh, I can pound my gavel. But, but let me just read you a couple scenarios that sometimes I share with, with the young people. And I, we won't talk about them in particular, but I just want to give you a flavor of how religious freedom claims play out uh, in society. Because oftentimes what we read in the newspaper 
is kind of the most sensational conflicts, right? Those are the ones that make the news, um, and they seem to be just very polarizing, and they are sometimes, uh, but, the, but it also comes up in many other scenarios. So here's an example. Um, uh, the plaintiff is a devout Muslim whose religion requires her to wear a hijab or head covering whenever she's in public. Her boss at a fast food chain where she works tells her that she can't wear the hijab while she's at work because it doesn't, quote, fit the uniform and makes some of the customers nervous. Can he do that? You don't have to answer. Just think about it. Is that okay? Here's another one. This one's a famous case. Plaintiff is a Native American that was fired from his job as a drug addiction counselor after his employer discovered that he occasionally participated in Native American religious ceremonies where a mild hallucina uh, hallucinogenic called peyote was smoked as part of sacred uh, rites. The state employment division ruled that he was ineligible to receive his unemployment benefits because his termination was a result of the violation of the employer's policies and also violated state law because peyote was illegal uh, in the state of Oregon, which is where this occurred, and that you couldn't consume it for any purpose, even for a religious one. So should he be allowed to collect his benefits? Supreme Court said no. This was in 1990. I'll give you one more. This one is in the news recently. A city allows private groups to fly a flag on a designated flagpole outside City Hall. All that's required is for the group to fill out an application with the city clerk who determines whether the flag is consistent with the city's uh, overall messages, practices, and policies. Various community groups have flags have flown from the polls, including flags for private organizations, charitable uh, organizations, LGBTQ plus organizations, private schools, businesses, etc. The city had never denied an application. So the plaintiff in this case is a nonprofit group that desired to fly a quote unquote Christian themed flag depicting a cross to celebrate the country's Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo heritage. The city denied the request, citing its concern that allowing a Christian flag to be flown from the city flagpole could be seen as the city, quote, endorsing a particular religion. What, what do you think should happen? Should they be allowed to fly their flag? So you're nodding yes? Well, the Supreme Court agreed with you. Uh, and this is a city of Boston case uh, a couple of terms ago. The Supreme Court said, if you're going to allow everyone to fly a flag, you have to allow religious people to fly flags too. Um, so uh, those are some of the examples, and you, you can think of others. Um, there's some prominent ones out of Washington that, that we could talk about um, that deal with religious liberty and religious rights. But I guess the point of telling Ray's story and the point of sharing some of these examples really is to say these are real people. Right? Sometimes it's easy when we, we get caught up in the news and, and, and read about these cases, we just think, oh yeah, it's, just, it's the culture wars, and you know, they're, they're just people fighting each other over who's going to win the culture wars. But these are, these are real people. They impact um, uh, real uh, desires. They impact people who don't believe in God. They impact people who do believe in God. They impact people of majority religions and minority religions. Um, and so what I want to talk about today, is the, as the title suggests, well, I guess, I guess you can't see the title. <laughs> I haven't switched any slides, so don't worry. Um, it is, is how we balance these competing priorities, right? Because we, we do live in a, a pluralistic society. Um, we have people that have very different views on the way society should be organized um, and what should be protected and what shouldn't be protected. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what religious freedom in the United States kind of means uh, at least from my perspective, uh, and then also talk a little bit about uh, maybe a, a, the way that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints approaches religious freedom issues, which is not the same as every other kind of religious organization, but, but nevertheless, it's the way that the church, our church um, uh, uh, approaches it. And then kind of at the very end, talk about a few ways that you could become involved, not in a particular way, but just some principles that you could apply in your lives if you were interested in becoming involved in protecting these important lights. So this is the you, you be the judge activity. I'm not going to make you be the judge, but you can start thinking of it like a judge here as we go through. So the first thing that I want to talk about is just the universality of religious beliefs. So 
I started with the Ray Torcaso story because I didn't, I wanted to kind of make a point that religious freedoms for everybody, including people who have no belief, is that up there? Okay. <laughs> including people that have no belief in God at all. Um, everybody has religious beliefs. Um, and when I say religious beliefs, the, court, the courts in the United States haven't really defined what religion is. They, they try to, but they, they're very inconsistent about what they say. Um, but for purposes of our discussion, I think that we would call religious beliefs is beliefs about the kind of ultimate purpose of life, right? Even the belief of, that you don't believe in a divine being is a religious belief in that sense, right? That you have a view on what life's purpose is, why you're here, whether there is a divine being or not a divine being, or whether you don't know. These are all kinds of religious beliefs, whether you're part of an organized organization or church or established religion, if you will, or whether you have your own unique view on how you relate to the world and to, to God or whatever you might refer to as God. Everybody has them. So even the most uh, uh, adamant atheist, I, I would argue for purposes of protecting religious belief in the United States, is a religious belief, right? Whether or not it's, so, so just to be clear, when we're talking about religious beliefs, we're not just talking about people who are sitting in chapels like this. We're talking about anybody and everybody who has deep conviction about purposes of life, how they use their moral agency, uh, how they relate to one another and to, uh, to a divine being if they believe in one. Oftentimes, the critics of religious liberty um, uh, make the argument that we, religion is, is not helpful because there's been so much violence carried out in the name of religion. Uh, and that's the problem, right? The problem is that people are very concerned uh, that when religion is combined with political power that there can be a lot of bloodshed. And in fact, that was the founders' experience, right? Hundreds of years before uh, the United States was founded, there was religiously motivated wars in Europe over the Protestant Reformation. Um, and, uh, and even among the Protestants, there was a lot of violence and persecution. Um, lots of uh, countries in Europe and even, even today have state-sponsored religions, religions that receive tax revenues uh, or tax distributions from the state. Um, and even though people generally in, in Europe are, are welcome to believe and follow whatever church they'd like, there is a church that is a preferred church um, in Europe. So there was hundreds of years of these religiously motivated wars. I don't know if you can see the cartoon there. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, you have to renounce, you don't know peace until you renounce your rabbit god and accept our duck god, right? Um, and, and, uh, and so that was the, the, the concern of the founders uh, because these, these bloody kind of wars that were so-called religious wars weren't really because of religion. They were because religion was combined with political and state power. It was when people co-opted the government to enforce their religious beliefs that really is the thing that caused the bloodshed. So religion itself wasn't the cause, it was this combination of state sponsorship or state uh, co-opting of religion to oppress those who didn't believe uh, like the government wanted them to believe, and that resulted in rebellion and back and forth. Now, I know something personally of this. Not really. But there is a, there is a, a famous uh, Reformation bishop in England named Bishop Hugh Latimer. That might ring a bell because my last name, my last name is Latimer. Now, I've done my family history. I can't connect me to Hugh Latimer. <laughs> there, maybe there's some connection there, but I still think it's cool that he's named Hugh Latimer. So Bishop Hugh Latimer was um, the Bishop of Worcester in, in the mid-1500s. It was right in the middle of the Protestant Reformation. It was a time in England when um, the, the monarchy was kind of bouncing back and forth between Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, King... Uh, King um, Henry VIII was a, a staunch Protestant. Uh, after he passed away, his, he was succeeded by King Edward VI. I had to write this down because I can't keep all the kings straight. Uh, King Edward VI, who was the younger half, uh, a younger uh, half brother to Queen, uh, someone who had become Queen Mary I. Uh, King Edward was also a, a Protestant. Uh, and then King Edward died uh, relatively young of an illness, and Queen Mary I. 
uh, sometimes referred to as Bloody Mary, uh, succeeded to the throne, and she was a staunch Catholic. And she immediately began to purge all the Protestant clergy from England. Uh, I believe she, had, she reigned for about five years, and over that course of five years, uh, it's estimated that 280 people were martyred uh, because they refused to renounce their, their Protestant beliefs. So, so who's Hugh Latimer? Hugh, Hugh Latimer is one of the Oxford martyrs. Uh, if you go to Oxford, England today, and you walk down one of the main streets, you're going to see a, a cross tiled in the road, and that is the place where Hugh Latimer and a few others, including a, a young man named Ridley, um, were burned at the stake for refusing to renounce Protestantism and accept Catholicism. They had been held in prison for a couple of years before that and eventually were trotted out in the street and burned. So, um, and at the, 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 I don't say it's a legend, I think it's just recorded in history, um, at the time that he was martyred, uh, as the flames began to kind of rise up around him, he said to his companion, Mr. Ridley, he said, be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. And then with that, both he and Ridley were, were executed uh, in Oxford. So I've been to Oxford. I've stood on the, the, the square. Uh, there's a, there's a, a church there with, his, uh, with this quote in it. So, um, but this is just an example again. This wasn't because of religion. It was because the person in power didn't like the particular religious beliefs of Bishop Latimer and, uh, and others that were with him. Um, so the founders of this country recognized it. It was a problem of religious violence. They were trying to avoid it. They recognized that they had the opportunity around the founding of this country to, to um, protect religious belief in a certain way that hopefully would reduce conflict over time. Uh, and that was really one of the, the objects or the projects that was, was being um, pursued by the founders of this uh, country. So what happens? Um, there is a group, uh, many of you know the Puritans, right? Thanksgiving, <laughs> big hats. Uh, what, they, left, they left Europe to come over to the America for what reason, ostensibly? Religious freedom. Uh, a large portion of them settle in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, so this is pre-formation of the United States. Uh, and what did they immediately do? They said, if you don't believe like us, you're kicked out of this colony, right? And, uh, and so this is sometimes referred to by scholars as the Puritan mistake. The Puritan mistake is we want, as people, we want religious freedom for us, but we don't particularly, in, we're not particularly interested in wanting it for other people <laughs> if they don't agree with us. Um, and so the Puritan mistake is just a term of art that, that scholars sometimes use to describe this tendency that we as humans have to kind of be okay with people that think and agree with us, but if they don't agree with us or if they have different views than we do, we tend to uh, not like them to be around and we tend to do things that would discourage those beliefs or ostracize them. So the Puritan mistake happened even uh, ostensibly by persons who were fleeing re religious persecution. They come to this place, they establish a place where they can worship as they choose, and then they immediately begin persecuting people who don't believe exactly like they believe, right? And I would suggest to you that, again, one of the things that our founders was tr were trying to do is to uh, solve this problem that so we wouldn't make this Puritan mistake. And I think it's a human condition. I think we do it all the time anyway, but at least they, there is a structure in place to kind of prevent maybe these, this kind of thing happening. And the, and the thought was, is if we can prevent this from happening through some kind of a constitutional structure, then maybe we can avoid all these conflicts that keep coming up when people um, you know, don't agree on what, what their beliefs should be. Um, so the, the founders believed that they needed to figure out how to solve that conflict. They also uh, felt like it was a, and this is, you know, political philosophers at the time said, look, we're going to establish this very new kind of idea that people would actually be governing themselves, that they would, they would be able to choose what kind of country they wanted to live in. And we think in order for citizens to do that effectively and long term, there needs to be a certain amount of virtue, right? We need to inculcate virtue. And so religion is good, right? Whatever religion it is, it's generally good in inculcating virtuous values of 
you know, obedience and faith and, um, you know, morality and those kinds of things. And so not only was, you know, protecting religion deemed important to prevent conflict, but it was also a way to encourage virtuous living by, um, uh, by those who are, who are gonna be ultimately governing. So that was the theory behind it. So in the United States, I think all of you will recognize this. Uh, one of the ways this gets structurally put into our, our constitutional system is through the First Amendment in the Constitution. The First Amendment has a number of clauses dealing with freedom of speech and expression, freedom of the press, uh, but it also includes what we sometimes refer to as the religion clauses. Um, which are up on the screen for you, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So these are sometimes called the religion clauses. Sometimes they're referred to as the first freedoms because they're one of the first things mentioned in the U.S. Constitution or in the Bill of Rights, I should say. Um, and it's really two uh, related but different points. Uh, the, first, the first item bolded up there is the Called, so referred to as the Establishment Clause, right? And what the Establishment Clause essentially uh, does is it ensures that there aren't uh, laws so that the, the, the state can adopt and, be, and, and adopt a church, uh, a state church, right? So unlike in England or in other countries in Europe, there was, by virtue of the Establishment Clause, a decision not to allow an official state church to be adopted by by government, whether it be a state or whether it be by the federal government. Initially, this applied just to the federal government, but it's since been expanded to the states as well. And in fact, individual state constitutions at the time, some of them had established state churches. They were taxing people, a state taxing, and they were distributing some of the funds to the local church. But, but this principle that there was going to be no state church was something that was deemed important enough to kind of uh, enshrine it in the Constitution. It also means that the government can't favor one religion or establish one religion over another. So in addition to not adopting an official state church that everybody has to support in some way or require them to participate in that church some way, government also can't just by virtue of the way they interact with religious organizations and churches prefer one over another. So that's called the Establishment Clause. The Free Exercise Clause is one that probably most of us are familiar with as well. And what it says basically is that government can't unreasonably burden someone's religious beliefs or expression without a compelling reason, right? So if you're passing laws and it tends to restrict people's ability to live their faith or to express their faith or somehow burdens their ability to do that, unless there's a really compelling government interest involved, and what, unless that law narrowly, is narrowly tailored to fulfill that interest, you really can't do it. So laws prohibiting, for example, human sacrifice, they're fine, right? Because arguably that could, could, that could burden someone's religious exercise, but that's a pretty compelling government interest <laughs> to prevent people being murdered. Um, and, and so those are fine. But other kinds of laws often implicate people's ability to live their faith, uh, and the government has to show that these are really important laws and they, they serve a really important interest and they're very narrowly drawn so they only protect that interest and don't unnecessarily burden people's faith. So that's the First Amendment. That's kind of the baseline. Um, and the way I, you know, I diagram, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, but the way I di diagram this out here is that um, they kind of provide a little bit of a shelter for religious belief. On the one hand, the Establishment Clause says, you can't prefer one religious belief over another if you're the government, right? And you can't you know, require people to believe a certain way if you're the government. That's the Establishment Clause protection. On the other hand, you can't pass laws that make it difficult for people to pursue their own uh, moral journey or religious journey, um, uh, at least not unreasonably so. Uh, and so it provides this little bubble around religious belief and expression in the United States that is intended to be protective. And the founders thought, if we do that, then there's a couple of results. One is that um, you're going to reduce conflict, right? Because as soon as the government can do some of these things, then there's going to be a lot of competition to control the government. Because if you can get the, the reins of power, you can oppress the person you don't like, <laughs> right? You can, you can make the Puritan mistake, but now you have the, the, the power behind you to do that. Right? And so if government just has to stay out of religion altogether, then at least with respect to that area, there isn't going to be 
a lot of conflict. That's the theory. Um, also, uh, many feel, and I personally believe this, um, if, if you are compelled to believe, it's not really belief, <laughs> right? right? To those of us who believe that faith and choice are important in terms of whether or not they're efficacious for a religious reason, um, if you live in an environment where you really have no capacity to exercise those choices, it all of a sudden becomes kind of almost meaningless. So this zone of protection is set up by the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Uh, it's since been uh, supplemented by a number of laws. I'm not going to go through all these laws, so don't worry, but you will happy to talk about them later if you want to. So uh, under federal law, we have various statutes called the, one's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is enacted in the 90s. It was actually directly in response to that Native American case uh, I mentioned to you. Um, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, sometimes referred to as ARLUPA, uh, which deals with land use rights with respect to religious organizations. Um, Civil Rights Acts of 1964 prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion in employment and in public accommodations. There's a Fair Housing Act, Federal Fair Housing Act, that pro prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion in the context of, uh, of housing, you know, renting and, and selling uh, homes. Uh, and then state, law, state laws have similar protections. Every state's a little different, but state constitutional protections, some state have these uh, RIFRAs, they're called Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, that provide an added measure of protection to religious belief. And again, when I say religious belief, remember, it doesn't have to be someone who has a specific belief in a certain type of God or belief of God at all, but it's really protecting moral conscience. Okay, so um, let, me, let me share to you, so, uh, just as an example, I want to share to you again how the Latter-day Saint perspective on this, right? So lots of uh, people of faith or people of no faith have a view on how religious freedom issues should be worked out in our society, and this is just one way. But the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is the way that we, we approach it. Um, so I'm not saying it's the way that everybody has to approach it, but it's a way to think about uh, how you deal uh, with these kinds of issues as they come up. How do you, co how do you balance competing rights um, when you have religious uh, belief conflicting perhaps with, with other beliefs? So in our religious tradition, we certainly agree that religious liberty is a civil good, and we believe it leads to order and to freedom and there's a lot of empirical evidence that actually says that the more religious freedom there is in a particular country, the more peaceful or less public strife there is. So think about uh, countries that have less religious freedom than the United States and some of the issues that they have with respect to uh, strife and, um, uh, and public uh, uh, challenges that they have. Not that we don't have our own, but, um, but certainly other areas have it much worse. Um, but for a member of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, and many other faith traditions, uh, religious freedom goes much dip, uh, deeper than just having kind of community uh, peace. So we believe that the, one of the greatest gifts God has given to his children is the concept of moral agency, right, or free will, the ability to, to come to earth to choose good or evil uh, and grow and learn from those experiences and hopefully become better people as a result of that. So Latter-day Saint faith tradition teaches us that, that God actually paid a very large price for us to have this opportunity, to come down to exercise those freedoms. And of course, we can't have that full range of opportunity if we live in a, a cultural or a legal environment in which that free expression uh, is constrained. So one of our church leaders put it this way, quote, uh, religious liberty helps us preserve the benefits of the atonement of Jesus Christ to each soul because it protects agency in the matters of faith. It is this agency that is the crucible, the fiery furnace of adversity and decision in which we determine our eternal destiny. It is the crossroads and sometimes the cross where each of us decides whether or not to choose Christ and his commandments. Oops, gotta go down on the quote here. Exercising that agency is the very purpose of a mortal life and Latter-day Saints understand that religious liberty it's primarily about preserving our right to choose Christ and live, live his gospel. And for us, respect for the same principle of agency impels us to grant reasonable tolerance to others who choose differently. So 
Um, this is, you know, I don't think this is a unique to Latter-day Saint theology that free will and choice is an important part of our mortal journey. Um, but there's a recognition that protecting that for everybody, even people who might choose differently than we might particularly choose, is an important feature of any kind of civil government. This is a quote from Joseph Smith, who was the first president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and also um, uh, someone we regard as a prophet. I won't, you can read the quote. Um, but he was very, uh, he thought religious liberty was very important. And those of you who know a little of the history of the church uh, know that there was times in the church's history where religious liberty was pretty tenuous. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, he, he was a staunch defender of the rights of everybody to believe and pursue those beliefs as they um, wanted to. I'll give you another one. Um, you're not going to be able to read the left hand of this slide. But uh, the Latter-day Saints in the 1840s established a city in Nauvoo, Illinois, uh, kind of because they were on the run from a lot of religious persecution. And one of the first ordinances in the city of Nauvoo uh, was, the, sec the second one adopted actually, uh, was this ordinance that you can read part of it um, uh, on the screen here, which granted all religions in the city of Nauvoo to have, quote, free toleration and equal privileges in the city. So Latter-day Saints have a long tradition of uh, believing religious liberty is important, uh, not only for ourselves, but for those who don't necessarily believe as we believe. Um, not saying we are perfect uh, as a people in actually uh, living up to those ideals, but certainly these are ideals that ha have began at the very beginning of, um, of the church and, and were important um, in, in our doctrine and our theology. So, I'm mindful of the time here. So what, what is religious freedom then? Let me suggest to you that you know, the things on the slide here are, are some things we might think about when, we, when, we think what, when we're defining what it means. Uh, we believe uh, that it's the right of all people to hold religious beliefs or no religious belief at all and to express that openly and without fear of persecution or punishment or losing their rights of equal citizenship. We also believe that it's the right of people to freely to be able to choose or change their religion and to teach their children, um, their, their faith to their children, to receive and to disseminate religious information, to talk and debate about that together with others, to worship in discussion and learning and to participate in ceremonies and practices that they believe further their religious belief. We believe it's the right of all people to be protected from religious discrimination in housing and employment and traditional places of public accommodation like stores and uh, parks and things like that. It's the right of all people to be protected from religious discrimination that would allow them to operate a business or have a professional license. And we believe it encompasses um, the, um, it's not, just a, it's, it's not just an individual right, but it's a right that adheres to organizations of people who collectively join together uh, to worship or to teach or to organize uh, as religious societies. And we believe it's the right to establish doctrine for those institutions, modes of worship, to organize ecclesiastical offices, to determine who the clergy of those organizations to be, determine membership standards and employees, employment standards, and and the ability of those organizations to own property and construct places of worship. Now, religious, um, religious liberty can't be absolute, right? I just gave you a kind of an extreme example earlier, right? You can't do anything and just say, well, it's my religious belief, I'll just do anything, right? That would be chaos, right? But we do believe that limits are appropriate when it's necessary to protect compelling government interests in maintaining order and safety and the rights of other people in society but those limitations really do need to be compelling, right? They can't just be convenient. Uh, they can't just be something that most people would like to have happen, but they have to be things that really um, are, are compelling interests that, that government has uh, the right to be able to refuse to let people do in the name of civic order and the right, protecting the rights of others. Uh, and we believe that if, if those if it ever crosses those lines, or we believe it crosses those lines, that we have the right to be able to obtain redress through the use of courts or, or through political process or other way. So let me just now shift kind of to the end here uh, for, for this kind of basis. So, so one of the things that we um, 
we find in religious liberty discussion is there is conflict still, right? Hopefully not physical conflict, but definitely conflict. And where the conflict comes up is that as people seek to live out their religious beliefs, um, they will often come in conflict with people who have different beliefs, right? And sometimes um, those, those beliefs come into conflict, and how do you judge about you know, which, which priorities should prevail? Um, so the way, the way the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, looks at this um, is that um, we ought to identify the core rights that we're trying to protect, and then figure out with those respect to those rights that are less important, how we can negotiate some kind of a compromise with those who may believe differently than us. So everybody believes in the abstract that religious freedom is important. I think you would find very few people if you went up to them and you said, um, uh, you know, uh, do you think that preserving religious belief and, and freedoms is, okay, is important? Everybody goes, sure. Yeah, I mean, why not? I don't have a problem with that. The problem is, is when you start saying, but what about when this happens? Or what about when that happens? And then people have very different views about how, how much we should be protecting uh, religious liberty. So we ought to prioritize them. And this is what, you know, the, I think the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints tries to do. Um, and it's, again, it's one way to approach this topic, but it's the way that, that I think the church's institution has approached it. Um, so if we start prioritizing, we look, need to look at what the core religious liberty rights are, right? So um, let me just su suggest to you a few of them. So really at the core uh, of religious liberty is the right of members of a religious organization or individuals and families to live and express their faith um, and, to, and for a church to operate in accordance with this doctrine. So included in this, these rights are the ability to express your beliefs to other people, to a willing listener, uh, the freedom to determine your church um, criteria, uh, the, tr the freedom to uh, select clergy for that church, uh, etc. The freedom of mothers and fathers to teach children in their home, the freedom to build buildings or temples or other religious edifices and uh, subject to kind of re reasonable zoning requirements around those structures, and the right to, to participate with free speech in the public square, and to talk about controversial matters without being punished for it. Uh, it's also the freedom to petition the government uh, for protection if you feel like those rights or basic rights are being trampled. And these are really core rights. Like from, from, from the church's perspective, these are not negotiable rights. Uh, if you start infringing on these kinds of rights, you start infringing on the very existence of a religious faith or organization. But you can go a little bit farther out the core, and this is the freedom of, of a person not to be excluded from professions or employment based on religion. So think about doctors or nurses or pharmacists or others who might have moral objections to administering certain kinds of procedures or drugs, but they're licensed by the state. And the state says, unless you're gonna do these kinds of things, you can't be, uh, you can't be in this profession. We won't grant you the appropriate licenses. Um, these include rights not to be punished because of their viewpoints. Uh, their particular views on particular social issues, um, and obviously includes you know the right to participate in the government, um, you know public office. Uh, the Constitution has an ex express right to. There is no religious test for public office, um, and those with traditional beliefs about marriage and family and sexuality, and those with non-traditional beliefs about those topics, shouldn't be excluded uh, from these kinds of professions and employment simply because of those beliefs, because the government you know, has some reason to, uh, some oversight of those professions, okay? Leading out from that core further is the freedom of church schools and closely related organizations like uh, charities and nonprofits to operate according uh, to church doctrine and policies. Um, church schools or nonprofits should have the freedom to choose by employment practices persons that will agree to adhere to the mission and standards of that particular organization Religious colleges should have the freedom to establish honor codes or other kinds of codes of conduct for students and faculty who attend or are employed by those colleges. And religious charities should have the right to conduct their good works according to the dictates of their own conscience and their religious beliefs of the organization that sponsors them. Right. So I would suggest to you that these three areas, these are kind of core rights 
that these are the rights that uh, those who want to protect religious freedom ought to be most concerned about. Uh, and when we bump into other competing rights in society, uh, we, we probably should do our best to keep these rights in place because they go to the very fundamental uh, existence of, of religious faith. Now we get to uh, a little bit farther out from the circle, right? Um, so as we move from these core rights out to kind of more commercial ventures, the rights of religious freedom become less important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying that, that they don't exist. I'm just saying that we ought to be uh, able to accommodate a little bit more intrusion on those rights as we get into the commercial uh, world. And that's not because commerce isn't important, uh, but it's just because in commerce uh, in business interactions, we tend to interact with a lot of more people, right? It's not a matter of personal uh, faith and devotion, but now we're starting to engage with lots of people from around society, and there's more likelihood that conflicts are going to come up in a commercial setting. Um, so uh, we would suggest that, or I would suggest, I think the church's position is that the that small family businesses have more a need for religious freedom protections than large, uh, diverse corporations. Again, not that the large companies don't have some religious uh, rights that should be protected, but it's more compelling to suggest that small family businesses that are really identified with the religious beliefs of the particular owners ought to have more protection uh, than less. Uh, similarly, large businesses they ought to be able to operate, of course, with the religious beliefs of those who own or manage them. But the larger they get, the more they start bumping into lots of other uh, interests in society. Uh, and so we're probably going to need to figure out you know, how to negotiate those, those interruptions a little bit more in that realm. And finally, the freedom of government employees not to perform duties that conflict with religious beliefs. So this would be an example for a government employee who's the county clerk uh, who refuses to process a marriage license for a same-sex marriage based on their uh, opposition to same-sex marriage, but it's nevertheless legal and required uh, government service to provide those licenses to same-sex couples. Um, that, that's probably where, um, if, the, if it's the only person in the office that can process that, uh, that application, that's probably where those religious rights are, are kind of the lowest. But if there's other people within the office that could do the same thing, there, there might be able to be an accommodation. Um, so these, these circles I've just showed you are an approach, right? And, and there's certainly blurry lines in all of them where you could say, well, you know, I think we got to be a little bit more protective of this area or that area. Um, but the point is, how do you resolve conflict, right? So this slide just shows you, let's talk about religious rights and other important rights, whether it's um, you know, uh, rights related to uh, soji. Soji is a phrase, it's sexual orientation, gender identity. That's, if you hear me use that, so that's what it means. Soji rights, when, what happens when these religious rights conflict with these other important civil rights? Um, and our suggestion is that we ought to uh, define for ourselves what our core religious rights are and ought to be protected, uh, and what the core religious rights, or, or the core rights are of whatever other group that is, being, that is concerned or involved. And that both groups need to come together and figure out how to protect each other's core rights while finding an area of compromise uh, in between. Right, so um, this is my very rudimentary Venn diagram, <laughs> right? There is a zone of compromise, right, where you could find uh, religious liberty protected while other important rights can be protected as well. But to find that zone requires work. It's hard. It requires people of good faith and will on both sides to say, we live together in a country where we have very different views maybe on certain issues, um, but we still are here together and we have to figure out a way to live together. And the only way in our view that we're gonna be able to do that is if we figure out a way to protect the core rights of those who, of religious belief and the core rights of those maybe who have other competing rights and protect both of them and then find a way in between to negotiate the differences between the two. So a couple of examples um, from, the, from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In, in uh, 2015, there was a really unique uh, coming together of, uh, of uh, not just the church, but many religious groups uh, and the LGBTQ community in Utah 
to establish um, a compromise. They called it the Utah Compromise, of all things, um, where important protections for LGBTQ individuals were granted by law in terms of housing and employment in exchange for religious organizations being able to be exempted from some of those requirements so that they could fulfill their unique religious mission. And I wasn't involved in the Utah Compromise. I've only read about and talked to people that were involved in it. But the approach was, we need to be able to fulfill our unique religious mission, which means we need to have standards for our universities. We need to be able to uh, preserve hiring uh, processes in our, um, in our institutional, religious institutional areas to, to make sure that we're fulfilling our mission appropriately. But nobody should be denied housing because of their sexual orientation. Nobody should divide employment because of their gender identity. Right? We, ought to, we ought to find a way to be respectful to one another, even if we disagree on certain aspects of how one might want to live their lives. So the Utah Compromise is an example of this, where people from both sides of the aisle came together uh, and said, we're going to hammer this out. And I don't pretend that it was easy. Um, I'm sure there were lots of profound disagreements on where the line should be drawn, but that, that's one example. Another example recently was the church's support of the Respect for Marriage Act. Some of you may have followed this. Um, Respect for Marriage Act essentially codified the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that allowed um, same-sex marriage you know, to be legal throughout the United States. Uh, and many people were surprised that the church came out in favor of this act since as a as, as matter of doctrine um, we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman um, but president uh, Dallin H. Oaks who's the, one of the members of the first presidency of the church kind of explained that this was an effort to compromise uh, the respect for marriage act provided uh, very robust religious exemptions for organizations that had different uh, views on marriage than than were codified in the act um, and yet it, the act itself provided some protections for LGBTQ folks to continue to kind of live in the manner that they felt like they should live. Um, and so um, these are ways of compromise. And I think you know you have a good compromise when um, everybody says, that was a bad deal. <laughs> then you know you probably have compromised just about right. So my time is up, but here's, here's my challenge for you. A lot of people say, well, this is really interesting. Religious liberties, I, I think it's important but I don't, know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about it. And let me suggest just a few things and then I'll end. Uh, first, um, just you know, to those of you who are, you know, have a, a religious faith of, of a particular kind, whatever kind that might be, just live your faith deeply and with conviction. Um, one of the largest, um, I think it is the largest growing religious group in America right now is the unaffiliated sometimes called the nuns, not the N-U-N-S, but the N-O-N-E-S, <laughs> right? Um, and because of that, the importance of religious faith in a more traditional sense is becoming less valued. Um, and to the extent we can all try to live in accordance with our, our religious convictions in a faithful and good way, I, I think that we can uh, hopefully be an example that religious faith is a positive value in society. Um, second, I would suggest we ought to all try to defend religious rights of those that we disagree with, um, especially if they're part of a minority community that can't defend themselves. So that might mean that we decide to step up with someone that we have profound theological agreements with, disagreements with, um, but we recognize that shutting them down or punishing them for those is just wrong, and we ought to defend those, um, those folks. Um, we ought to moderate and unify on contested issues. This is a statement, again, from one of our church leaders who said that Latter-day Saints, but I would suggest anybody uh, who feels like these are important issues, ought to be um, voices of moderation and unification in our public discourse. It doesn't mean we can't have conviction and we can't defend our principles or that we have to kind of abandon what we believe, but it ought to mean that we do so with uh, compassion and and with a goal and good faith so that our those who might believe differently in us are not seen as enemies uh, but whether as friends with, with whom we dis disagree and I think if we can be a moderating and unifying influence in these discussions um, that will go a long ways to healing some of the divide we feel in our country 
Religious liberty issues come up mostly in local settings, believe it or not. We read about the things on the front page of the newspaper. They're the Supreme Court arguments, right? All of those things happen locally first. So be aware of what's going on in your community, what's happening at the city council. A lot of times religious uh, liberty um, issues come up when people just don't realize what they're doing impacts or burdens a religious belief or expression. Uh, so if you're aware and what's going on in your community, and you see something, you go, geez, I think that's going to hurt my, friend, my Buddhist friends, right? Or I think that's going to hurt my, you know, Methodist friends or whoever, whatever. Maybe I should, maybe I should raise my hand and say, let's, let's not be too hasty here. And then lastly, I just encourage us all to be more engaged in our communities. So I don't think you need to go to law school. I don't think you need to become a religious liberty expert. I don't think you need to, um, you know, uh, join a political party or initiative, although you can do all those things if you want. Uh, but I think most of us, what we can do most effectively in our communities is to just live our faith, be engaged, defend those who are too powerless to defend themselves, uh, at least defend their right uh, to live in accordance with their principles. And if we have religious liberty for all, uh, then, then we'll be able to have greater peace and harmony in our communities, and even each, each of us will be able to pursue the path that we desire to pursue. On the other hand, if, we, um, re if even one person doesn't have religious liberty, then none of us do, because the only difference between that person and us is that we have the power and they don't. And when the, when the table flips and they have it, then ours is gone, right? So we need to get out of this uh, idea of whoever has the bigger club is going to win. We got to figure out, in my opinion, we have to figure out how to how to work together um, with our convictions uh, to heal the divide in this country. So thank you for your time. And I, I I've gone over, so I probably won't do Q and A, but I'm happy to to spend some time with you in the cultural hall afterwards if you have questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Hey, thank you so much, Matt. That was excellent, and I took a lot of notes. Um, I hope you enjoyed this um, lecture today and that you learned something new, and I hope that we can all work together to defend religious freedom and rights in our community and in our country. So I wanted to just say a few more thank yous. Um, Carl Otterstrom was in charge of our um, he recorded this meeting today, or it's live streamed on YouTube, and it will be on the Spokane Stakes YouTube page, YouTube channel if you wanted to watch it. And also, I wanted to thank Penny Estock for uh, leading um, the food. We have a number of people that brought food today, so thank you to all of you who brought food, and then Penny for helping to organize um, the, the um, setup and cleanup of the food. So. Thank you all again for being here, and we're going to end with a um, closing hymn, My Country Tis of Thee, closing song, number 339 in the hymn book. And after that, our closing prayer will be given by Brent Mon. And I encourage you to stay for a little bit. Um, if someone in the back could help open up the, the um, partition there when we're done, I would appreciate that. So, hymn 339.
Our Father in heaven, we express our appreciation uh, for thee. We thank, express our appreciation for Brother Latimer, for his words of uh, education, of refinement, of uh, motivation. We appreciate it for the religious freedoms that we do have and pray that we can have them going forward. We pray for uh, the welfare, happiness, safety of all of thy children uh, for whatever their persuasions of faith is. We pray that we may have greater um, compassion in our hearts for all, that we might be peacemakers and help all uh, have joy and happiness and uh, accomplish uh, their purposes here on this earth. We pray for uh, the refreshments, uh, for the health of our bodies. Bless and be, protect us as we go our various ways, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.